All right. It is September already. It's amazing. It's almost December. It's crazy. September 6th, Wednesday, September 6th. Um, I am uh, head down working on the Digital 360 Summit. It's coming up. We have an amazing number of things going on um and uh you know excited about it so we'll talk many things we have a great guest today but before we get rolling let's have our own john sibley butler give us some intro music they're working while i'm missing you those healing hands of time soon they'll be allowing me those healing hands Already, I've reached mountain peaks, and I'm just beginning to climb. And I'll get over you quietly. Oh, healing hands of time. All right, thank you, John. How you doing today? Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very, very well. I went back and uh, reread the entire book of the Wealth of Nations, and then I looked at some of the stuff on uh, by Durkheim, and I went back and read some 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 German economic ideas to try to make sense, if you will. If Adam Smith was still the the answer, see, I did that, and it's it's pretty wild what's happening around the whole world, uh, and. Uh, kind of ended up with equilibrium theory, which I'm not sure uh, was correct because I don't think that the normal economy is in equilibrium. I think it's in constantly chaos, especially with the te te technology stuff. Of course, I had all of the football on the weekend. My alma mater lost to uh, Florida State and my Longhorns are going to play Alabama. So uh, my Tigers won the first half and lost the second half. And, and we, Texas, got to go beat Alabama. Alabama uh, this weekend, but isn't it strange, uh, uh, Llewellyn and uh, Andreas, of how the digital economy is kind of playing havoc with our models of of, of the economy, and what I, what I mean by that is that um, the model of the economy, as was with mercantilism, was was talked about. You know, what is mercantilism? You just grab what you can. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, uh, with uh, with Martin, with, with Adam Smith, it came in machines and wealth came not from just grabbing stuff, but it came from uh, machines and, and, and products and products became uh, very, very interesting. And now, of course, those products are not just related to one kind of nation. Uh, the supply chain means that they're all around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So Adam Smith never dreamed, for example, that our whatever cell phones would be made in, in, in China. Mm -hmm. The wealth of nations have changed, so I had my mind on that. But otherwise, it's still hot in Austin, Texas, and uh, I'm hoping that my employee, the University of Texas, would beat the hell out of Alabama. And it's, it's good to see Llewellyn, and and it's good to see you, uh, Mr. Crenshaw. Llewellyn, how are you, sir? Very well. The, your Texas heat has arrived here. We're around over ninety, which we think. In New England, it's very, very hot indeed. Um, I, I, I'm sorry that Jordan has to leave early because that doesn't give me so much time to attack Johnny's arguments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, uh, it. <laughs> a, a quick crazy. I just got off a long webinar with India and uh, uh, China, etc. And uh, it's really disturbing to me the extent to which they see an east-west divide. They also see a divide between themselves, but an east-west divide. And India, which is riding high and which will host the uh, G20 summit uh, in three days, uh, is really feeling quite imperial. Uh, they've landed a rocket on the moon. They've... Uh, their, their their rate of growth has gone up dramatically. They've moved up. They think in a couple of years they'll be number three. They think they'll pass China. They see China as in decline. The Chinese seem to be uh, hell-bent on fortress China, not engaging with the world as it has. 
the assumption I find talking to people in the US is that we think we are boxing China in. It would seem from my conversations, at least today, that China is boxing China in, which is interesting. The technological evolution goes on, but there are two great existential forces that we have to deal with. One is climate change, we're bearing on this heat of flooding, first, first uh, drought, then flooding in, in Europe, particularly at the moment, today in Greece, and uh, uh, the arrival of AI and what it will do to everything. Uh, the, the value of documents, the value of written and created work, and ultimately the value of work, how it will subtract from that. I tend to think it will subtract uh, the, the, the protagonists uh, of AI and the protagonists of uh, automation say that automation has always traditionally enhanced employment. I think we have a different animal at work here and it behooves us to take a look at it. And uh, so the world is changing about us and we're not sure that we are, I'm not sure by any means that we are either politically or emotionally or psychologically equipped to deal with these big new truths. Well, you know, you, you guys bring up some interesting points. I do have to remind us all that technology seems to always save the day. And we have a great speaker to help us understand and navigate how things are going in the United States. Jordan Crenshaw is uh, vice president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and he manages all this technology outreaches and programs uh, helping the commerce of the United States get automated and get high tech and learn how to use AI and all this thing. Jordan, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Pleasure to be here today. Yeah. And you're joining us from LA, I take it. I am. I'm actually here for a city CIO tech conference, actually. And, and, I, and I assume that the weather is fabulous. Uh, you know what? Uh, Southern California has uh, been a little iffy in the weather department this year, uh, but I, I did see a little bit of sun today. So um, Yeah, be be before we get going with you, I have to do an update on something that is finally in interesting to me. I don't know how many of you have ever been to the Burning Man. I've never been. Uh, don't find it particularly exciting to uh, go into a place where 10,000 people are drinking at the same time and you don't know what you're going to eat the next day. But I understand that they have been, <laughs> they are all cordoned in and flooding has taken place and <laughs> nobody can escape and they're all trapped and they're going to run out of provisions. I find it crazy as hell that uh, even, even the burning man in Nevada is suffering from climate change. Incredible. So and that it's happened, and and Andres, that it's happened in America. That this can happen in America. That so many people can get isolated by weather. Yeah, it's a, it's fascinating. So Jordan, tell us tell us what's going on with the chamber and how 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 are things for you in twenty twenty three? And we're almost coming to the final stretch here, heading into twenty twenty four. So give us a give us a summary and an update, and perhaps a little bit of what's coming up. Yeah, happy to do so. Um, obviously, um, tech is a big issue for all of our members, given the fact that they're either developing it or embracing it. Um, the Chamber, we actually represent 3 million companies uh, through our local state uh, network and as well as our federal uh, program. And our real goal of the Chamber is to tell the story of technology uh, it's helping Americans and advocate for rational policy solutions to uh, protect consumers, but also uh, reap the benefits uh, of tech. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we have seen a lot of different priorities this year in terms of the Chamber uh, and in terms of what we'd like to see in the tech space. Um, you know, first, um, you know, you know, we continue to uh, push for U.S. AI leadership. Uh, that is a major issue uh, going forward. Um, you know, I think we have our concerns that uh, if we don't get policy right, uh, we risk losing uh, our leadership in this technology to China. Uh, and and that's going to take a variety of different policy um, areas. We actually uh, just recently released in March a report 
um, from our AI commission, which was a bipartisan commission led by former Congressman John Delaney and Mike Ferguson, both either on ENC or part of the AI caucus, uh, Republican and Democrat. We actually had a bipartisan group of experts on that commission. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, one professor from UT Austin, Alex Demakis, uh, uh, was actually on that commission and made some recommendations around things like how do we get the workforce ready for AI? How do we um, regulate AI? And then how do we compete with nations uh, that don't share our values? Uh, and so um, encourage folks to read that uh, at uschamber.com backslash AI. Um, and then um, other areas too, um, uh, obviously uh, protecting consumer privacy is a big issue. Uh, we want to see a uh, single national privacy standard passed uh, that actually, A, helps us be competitive because it gives business and consumers certainty um, and prevents a state patchwork, which could be incredibly costly to small businesses. Um, you know, we have seen states like Texas pass pretty good privacy legislation, but that's not to say other states uh, might not pass uh, business unfriendly legislation. Uh, and so uh, that's a major issue uh, as well. Um, and then another area, too, is um, government IT modernization. Um, you know, one of the areas that we found out was that uh, in talking to our member companies during COVID was the need for, for government to digitize and whether or not that be, uh, you know, through uh, digitizing and modernizing things like permitting and professional licensure to upgrading to cloud, um, it's it's imperative the government from a cost savings perspective and also from a, a citizen services perspective, uh, get on the program with the 21st century and, and get off things like 1950s uh, COBOL technology and, and embrace things like new tech. Um, but uh, a lot of different areas out there as well I can get into. Obviously, you know, we want to make sure that um, the broadband investments are successful that the federal government is putting out there, as well as the semiconductor investments that they're putting out. Um, and so there's a whole whole lot of different issues that are popping up in the tech space to uh, continue to help U.S. prosperity and help us remain competitive. That's very, very good, um, uh, John. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I want to I want to go back some years back when we did the Austin Miracle and I worked we worked really, really with our chamber led by Glenn West at the time, who was a legend around um, Austin. And one of the things that was interesting is 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 uh, is good to see that, that that you guys are really in the tech area but my question is given the globalization of business enterprises and given the fact that uh cities now set if you will it's going to sit on a cloud or sit on a platform i can remember when a big company in austin texas said the following i mean why should i pay my chamber dues when i'm a global company and then we said back to him well what we're going to do is we're going to refocus the chamber, make it a technology chamber, and make it a recruiting tool for business enterprises. So we went, we went from having the regular chamber events and dinners and et cetera to um, uh, a sort of a global chamber. So how do you see the funding of local chambers now? Are there any issues related to that because of the globalization? Oh, local chambers are incredibly important. Um, for example, um, uh, you know, as as different states proposing legislation, um, you know, those local chambers are instrumental and take the lead and 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 fighting back against bad tech regs, for example, or promoting good tech regulations. Uh, and they also are a great voice in Washington, D.C. as well. I think a lot of folks love hearing from back home uh, at, at the Capitol and, and, and those chambers have a lot of uh, a lot of good to say about what's really happening on the ground back home. So. Local chambers play a vital role uh, in um, the business ecosystem. Um, the U.S. Chamber, we we happen to be able to provide kind of a, a national cap uh, and summary of what's happening, and we're able to engage on an international level and sometimes state. Uh, but uh, those state chambers uh, have a, a real uh, role to play and, and are instrumental in achieving a lot of good policies. And their funding basically come from where? Is it still membership? The funding for the local chambers. I you know, mean, it, it 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 depends, but uh, you know, so our our local chambers are actually uh, members of ours. So I so yeah. a lot of them are independent. Okay. I have a question, uh, Jordan? Do you have any case examples where uh, something has happened because of tech uh, instruction or collaboration, where some advance has been made with a member, where? the central effect 
of the chamber being involved in technology has benefited a sector or an individual company? Well, I would say we've been instrumental, uh, broadly speaking, as the U.S. Chamber in a variety of areas. Um, you know, we help bring together um, uh, both Republicans and Democrats to help uh, achieve the historic uh, infrastructure package that was passed last year, which is translating uh, into uh, millions of dollars for underserved and unserved areas across the country who, who lack access to broadband, which is, uh, you know, fundamental now and essential to to, to business. Uh, so Chamber has played a definitive role there. We actually uh, were supportive of the Chips and Science Act, uh, which uh, passed Congress last year as well. And that is um, a bucket of money, uh, $50 million, along with tax incentives to uh, um, attempt to uh, get us more independent in terms of semiconductor capacity in the United States. Um, so a, a lot of different areas, um, I think, from, a, from an innovation standpoint, and even we're even seeing um, at this point um, uh, some of our own AI commission recommendations playing out uh, globally and on a national stage um, as, as AI policy is being recommended. You play a role in technology transfer. I handle the domestic side of the house at the U.S. Chamber, so um, so I, I generally tend to focus on more of the regulatory side, domestically speaking. And how how are we now when you compare America to other countries in terms of uh, the technology? So let's let's sort of get out. I mean, stay in your own uh, space. But if you were telling me that uh, if we do a comparison between the international kinds of uh, things that's happening that Llewellyn was talking about in India or in China and wherever. How do we set with our policy? How do we set with the, um, the, the ability of policymakers to grasp what is going on? Uh, do you have to do a lot of teaching, a lot of learning in your, in your, I know you do a lot of learning, but do you have to do a lot of teaching uh, in your space uh, as the, as the, uh, the chamber? So I'll say this, I, I get a, I get the opportunity to learn a lot from our member companies who are in the field, um, who are developing technology. I get a, a chance to actually even meet some of the folks at universities who are partnering uh, with the private sector uh, to learn about the ecosystem, about how they're uh, developing and, and uh, embracing tech. But at the same time, um, it, we have a, a great job at, at, at uh, educating policymakers um, in Capitol Hill and the White House um, about uh, the benefits of tech, um, and also what what policies we should put in place. You know, but I think I think finally bring up a good point when it comes to something like AI um, and looking how we stack up. Uh, I think if you look at the way the world is set up right now, uh, Europe is trying to write the rules and get ahead and get an advantage in that way. Um, we've seen that with passage of the GDPR on privacy. We now see the EU AI, AI Act is going through its um, close to final stages uh, in terms of the regulatory piece. Um, you know, the United States, um, unfortunately, uh, tends to side on patchwork approaches. Um, and I fear that we're going to see states try to pass their own things like AI regulations that may not necessarily um, uh, harmonize across the country, uh, which puts us at a disadvantage with, say, the EU um, and also with uh, with China. Um, and also China, on the other hand, though, they're not trying to write the rules, but they are trying to outspend us on R&D. Um, we we're dealing with copyright issues uh, as well. In fact, during one of our commission hearings, uh, we learned, um, uh, you know, in D.C. that we had, uh, we learned that uh, China is actually out patenting us in a lot of areas like robotics uh, or applying for more patents. So um, it really, uh, it should be eye opening. Uh, the U.S. does lead in a lot of different areas. It leads in fundamental rights. It leads in uh, innovation capacity. Um, but we really need to make sure that we tap into that. And we also learn the lessons of things like privacy to be more proactive on the policy front so that we can maintain our leadership. I have, I have, I have two basic questions. One interesting thing, of course, about the technology is the conversion of that technology to jobs and, and enterprises and et cetera. And we know there's variation, excuse me, Llewellyn, in, in America, where Texas has created four times the amount of jobs in any other state in the country. And where the Silicon Valley is now, Silicon Valley, but it used to be Detroit, and things are moving around. So, do you have any kind of notion as as we as as the policymaker look at bills, and some some areas, some region are just more entrepreneurial than other regions? Uh, do you guys track at all the the uh, conversion of uh, the new technology 
to business enterprise and how it enhances business enterprise. Uh, so that the clustering that takes place now, uh, to use a, a good MBA program <laughs> idea, the clustering that pl takes place now will be much more scattered given broadband. In other words, do you think about the business enterprise, the creation of business enterprise, and those kind of things? No, I, I think those are all important issues right there. And I think one I would reference a report that we actually uh, did on small business and tech last year, and we actually will be updating that next week. Uh, and I can give a little bit of a preview, but you know, in, in terms of this, is that we've learned that uh, tech um, using small small businesses that use technology have actually contributed uh, seventeen trillion dollars to the U.S. economy, um, and also that those same small businesses that are adopters of technology platforms, whether or not that be Square and payment apps or social media or any other type of tech also support 99 million jobs uh, throughout the U.S. Um, you know, one of the things that we learned from small businesses, though, is that 80 percent said the tech platforms help them compete uh, with larger companies. Uh, mm -hmm. It enables them to cut the costs. Uh, you know, in particular, I spoke to a, a coffee shop owner uh, on the West Coast who said that if, if he lost access to tech platforms and to data, it'd be like a second pandemic for him because he's able to compete with lower cost and overhead because he doesn't have to go out and buy lists and, and try advertising to uh, individuals that he knows or he's not going to get. Um, and so um, so I think that's that's the real boon, I think, from the use of technology for, for small business. Um, but other other kind of uh, ingredients there, too. I think we need to, you know, what we're going to learn is that most small businesses are concerned uh, about having to comply with a patchwork of regulations um, in particular, I've spoken to numerous small businesses you know, who say that I don't want to have to follow California regulations and I'm not even based there. And, and I think that's, that's an issue we've heard and the patchwork approach is, 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 is problematic. Um, we have seen states, for example, pass like good privacy legislation. We've seen Texas, Virginia, Tennessee have really looked at balanced approaches to this issue uh, in terms of getting privacy right. But at the end of the day, we need a federal privacy standard. Um, yeah. Another area too is broadband. Broadband access is is critically important um, to ensuring small business enterprises uh, succeed. And another area where we're hearing, and this is for seventy percent, this little preview for next week, um, is that seventy percent of small businesses want to see government modernize its IT in the area of things like professional licensure and permitting, um, so that it's easier. There's a one stop shop uh, for businesses to go to and and get a quicker answer. So, so those are a few things that we're seeing uh, that we've seen from our report so far. Let's talk about uh, our own Andre Cavallo, who has a solution about the relationship between privacy, who owns the data, and, and bringing all countries up to a certain level. Now, Andreas has talked about this at coffee shops. He talked about it online. I'm not saying that I'm sick of it, but we need a great, great evaluation of his ideas. Lou Ellen hasn't even given him an evaluation of his ideas. So I'm going to ask our, our host, the mighty Andreas Cavallo, who did all of the smart grids, to talk about the relationship between privacy, who owns the data, and economic development. Can you do that for me, my good friend? Oh, sure, sure. Well, you know, one of the concepts is... Uh you know, that um, we all generate uh, a significant amount of data, right? So like I use an Apple Watch and it tracks all my health and my movement and has all these rings about getting in fit, fit and shape and all that. And and you're connected and you get your messages and you can talk on the phone and, and all this data that we all create, ideally in a total digital world, should be controlled by me. And I should be the beneficiary of whatever my data, which is my copyright of my being, uh, gets used by others and leveraged by others, meaning I should be able to monetize my data. And so maybe I'm, you know, being a guinea pig on some heart study because I have a unique heart and people want to pay me for listening to my heart and so on and so on and so on. And so it turns out that we all generate roughly you know, a significant amount of data every month and every year in the tunes of terabytes. And if you equate that to what the value of that is in the network world, it's roughly something like $125,000 a year that I would should be able to get from subscribing all my data to all kinds of potential 
companies that would want to listen and watch, learn and, you know, monitor and the behavior of how I buy, where I buy, what I eat, where I eat, whatever, on and on and on, including the performance of my own body and my being in my relationships. And so maybe perhaps at some point, you know, there would be a a, a, a data lake of sorts with an impartial body like a U.S. Chamber of Commerce caring for every human being, not just the businesses that are LLCs or corps, but every com- every person who could be an LLC in a corp and move all their data to a trust. And then that data gets syndicated somehow like content and then monetized that way. So that's the concept behind what I keep talking about that eventually that could eradicate poverty. That would eradicate, you know, the fact that, you know, some folks don't have anything, even though they are already contributing to society by just being. You know, I think that's a great, great uh, concept. And that's the best I've heard it explained. What do you think about that, uh, Jordan? Well, you know, I'd say this. I think uh, right now, I think, you know, consumers do benefit from free products um, from data. Um, So I think, for example, everything from free email, uh, to just the use of the internet itself, for the most part, I think there's a benefit derived there. Um, now, one thing I would say about you know assigning a cost to to data or a value is there are a lot of complex considerations right now. For example, um, you know, say you're using inferred data, uh, and what kind of level of of, of 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 sweat of the brow approach I think uh, of of someone who's an- analyzing data, how much of that is uh, theirs and how much of it is attributable to the actual individual consumer, for example. So I think you, know, you throw AI in there too. And I think there are a lot of complex factors, but it's an interesting concept. What I would say though, is that uh, there need to be harms-based, rights-based uh, uh, protections for consumers when it comes to data privacy. For example, mm-hmm. um, a consumer should be able to go to a company and say, delete my data. Company mm-hmm. uh, consumers should be able to say, "I don't want you to sell my data." Mm-hmm. Uh, a consumer should say, "That data that you have about me is absolutely wrong, and I want you to correct it." Mm-hmm. Uh, or uh, opt out of automated processing of data and and things like uh, housing and employment. Um, you know, those those are the types of rights uh, that consumers, mm-hmm. you know, we feel, um, you know, really should have uh, in 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 the digital economy. So mm-hmm. even if we're dealing with the complexities of of the valuation of data. There are a lot of consumer rights that we know that we can address now um, from a harms and rights based approach. Um, and we've seen a lot of great solutions um, that have come out of places like Austin, uh, as well as uh, Richmond and, and a couple other states that have really gotten a, a good start on protecting consumer privacy. Jordan, doesn't it appear as though AI will sweep away those protections, that it is no respecter of anything uh, except its own? curiosity and patents, copyrights, all the things that we depend on to keep an orderly business community uh, may be in danger because the information will be so universally available and unprotectable. I think there are concerns about things like privacy. There are concerns about things like copyright. There are concerns about things like workforce when it comes to AI. Um, But I'm also a tech optimist uh, that I do believe that tech uh, can actually solve a lot of these issues at the same time. Um, you know, I think as it as it relates to, uh, you know, privacy, for example, I think passing a comprehensive privacy law is a good start uh, to protecting consumers uh, in that space. Uh, one of the issues we addressed in our own AI commission report was the issue around copyright and IP, um, questions of, of who owns uh, IP if it's say generative AI creates uh, something who who has the who has the copyright who ha- who has the patent uh, and and those are things that that will be addressed um, and we actually have some recommendations around that um, in the report uh, and I think you know as you look at things even like workforce for example you know I think as we have seen in other uh, uh, historical um, shifts in tech, um, we don't necessarily see mass job loss, but what we do see is uh, changing of jobs. And, um, you know, I, I'll provide one example uh, with workforce here. During one of our commission hearings we had out in Silicon Valley, we actually had the Teamsters come out and they testified. And we asked them, well, what are your concerns here um, about AI? And uh, it was interesting 
uh, that the response we got was, we're not worried about cataclysmic job loss. And this is one of the few groups that actually has every incentive to keep as many folks on the rolls as they can. Um, they said, though, that their main concern is um, uh, employers uh, using AI uh, in decision making uh, about them. Uh, and I think we've also seen that play out a little bit in some of the uh, Hollywood strikes as well, too. So, um, you know, I think those are some issues that are going to have to be resolved. Um, I think one of the things that we actually mentioned in our AI commission report is that um, agencies in the federal government should actually look to their current and existing authorities to see where they can uh, regulate where appropriate in this space. Congress needs to do an inventory uh, of that. And if Congress decides that that current regulatory regime just isn't adequate to address certain harms, uh, then we should take a risk-based approach to uh, protecting individuals uh, when it comes to, to AI. So AI is gonna bring a lot of new challenges. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're, we're, we really view this as a doomsday scenario with AI, but um, with every new tech, there are new risks and we have to be forward thinking about them. How about misinformation? Hmm. Uh, it's going to be very hard to establish the provenance of any statement, piece of writing, uh, allegation. It's going to be very, very difficult. The truth would seem to be in the crosshairs, yeah. And, and that's another issue area that we have heard about uh, as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think one of the areas uh, that our AI commission uh, provided as an example, um, and this is a form of misinformation, is the area of revenge porn um, and using AI to um, create um, uh, wow. new images of, of people without their consent uh, and that we don't find that there's a current regulatory regime in place uh, to really um, address that uh, without state laws or without, you know, some kind of federal legislation uh, in that spot. So, um, you know, I think we're going to have to weigh the risks and benefits um, of the technology, but there are areas that, that policymakers really do need to, to weigh in on. It seems to me that AI is global and ubiquitous and that state and federal regulation um, may not have any effect. It's sort of like putting a fence in the ocean. Well, and, and that's a very good point. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're we're opposed to a state-by-state -state approach uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, you know, I think as, as we mentioned at the beginning of our AI commission launch, um, you know, I think we have seen, um, you know, different uh, sectors of the world um, really go their own way. I think we saw Russia and China agree to collaborate on AI prior to the Ukraine invasion. Um, we have seen democratically aligned countries take different approaches. Um, the UK and Japan tend to take a little bit more of a, um, uh, a freer market innovation style approach to AI. Europe is looking at um, more uh, restrictions through the EU AI Act. Uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, Senator Schumer uh, has a working group of senators, along with others who are introduced to their own legislation, who are, who are starting to look at this issue as well. Um, but I think you're right. We're going to have to have dialogue between democratically aligned countries uh, to ensure that um, uh, AI aligns with those democratic values. Uh, and uh, you know, that's one of the reasons, actually, we're hosting uh, a forum uh, in about two weeks uh, we're actually going to have members of the Japanese Diet, uh, the UK government, um, the UAE, uh, and um, also members of the European Parliament, um, as well as um, members of the United States Senate and the White House come in to really talk about ways we can foster dialogue between uh, democratically aligned nations. Because if we don't, we you know, risk losing uh, our, our leadership to countries that don't share those values. It would seem to me that one of the worries should be malevolence from non-democratically aligned countries. It, it's it's a concern. And and when those countries don't share our values and when things like privacy and, and and other things like that, I think that that is a major concern for for us. And, and we, we would like to see a a uh, a Western and democratically aligned values approach, um, you know, nations like uh, Japan, South Korea, the UK. Uh, and, and Europe all really come together and, and decide, you know, that we want to make sure that we actually have uh, our own values leading AI, uh, as opposed to uh, those who don't share them. So Jordan, yeah, real quick, uh, uh, you know, let me jump in here, maybe uh, pepper you with some quick uh, questions and answers. Uh, when 
you look at um, things like, um, you know, AI as it relates to digitalization, computing, uh, autonomous vehicles, space travel, cryptocurrencies, um, things like, uh, you know, the grid of the future, water. What are some of the hot topics beyond AI that are really driving, you know, you all thinking about how new policies needed to tackle a new paradigm of wealth wealth creation, capitalism. What what are the areas that that we are navigating into new new domains that are requiring significant amount of you know gathering collaboration that you guys are fostering? No, I, I, and that's a great question. And there are other issue areas even beyond AI and privacy and and telecom. Um, but uh, one is autonomous vehicles. Uh, we actually just released a report with uh, Dr. Robert Shapiro, former uh, Clinton economic advisor, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that really showed that there uh, will be a tangible uh, public safety benefit as well as economic benefit and environmental benefit uh, from the use of autonomous vehicles. Uh, and so ensuring that we get a national framework in place, and I, I know it's like a broken record, but, you know, uh, you know, you don't get anything more interstate uh, than transportation and mm -hmm. making sure that we don't have a patchwork approach, but have a national approach uh, to automated vehicles. Um, uh, and another area, too, is is the use of um, unmanned aircraft. That's another one that we're looking at significantly has the ability to uh, provide greater mobility, delivery um, uh, safety inspections in dangerous areas. Uh, and, um, you know, I think part of that is ensuring that we have the right safety regulations in place of the FAA, uh, that those aren't too slow to come out. We need certainty about how to operate. But the other area too is, is Congress extending, um, counter UAS authorities as well so that we can actually go after malicious use of drones. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so I think, I think that's another area where we need to address both the benefits and the risks. Uh, but those are definitely um, areas that we're seeing uh, a lot of activity right now in the policy space. But there are others like quantum computing uh, that are that are coming, and 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 so uh, there there are a lot of different uh, types of emerging tech that we're keeping our eye on because they will have a, a significant impact in the economy. Yeah. Is there anything in particular, Jordan, that you guys are driving around the notion of new business models? Uh, people monetizing data, cities thinking about no longer taxing customers, but using data and selling data to corporations and so on. Is is there is there anything tan going on? Any thinking? Because you know we got Dr. John Butler here, who's a you know short of a genius and all these things, and and we're wondering, you know, he sits on the disruptor CNBC top fifty companies every year, and we keep thinking that. The technology is coming along really fine, but the issue is the re-engineering of how society allows that technology to move forward. And so business model is a big piece of that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think one of the constants we see is in technology is change. Uh, and there is a disruptor approach that uh, the U.S. seems to have an edge in um, when it comes to tech. So, for example, um, you know, it would have been... Uh, uh, an odd concept 15 years ago to say you get your phone to get a get a ride from some someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've seen the benefit from that. Um, and as I said before, small businesses say that their sales have gone up uh, mm -hmm. and their employment has gone up um, by having things like delivery apps where people will come from one store and deliver it to someone else. Yep. Um, and so um, that's a disruptive business model. Uh, but it's one uh, that has actually had a positive uh, effect on on things like small businesses. Um, I, I think we're also beginning to see, uh, you know, as I mentioned, small businesses are using um, things like social media and payment apps. Um, you know, I went to a farmer's market and every single person selling at the farmer's market is using a digital payment system. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's enabling... Uh, people who are not using cash anymore to actually work with small businesses. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I think you know we are seeing different business models emerge because of technology. Um, it's had a net positive uh, in our opinion, uh, but at the same time, obviously, uh, we want to make sure that we're looking out for the risks, and um, and and that's why it's important we get a balanced approach. Yeah, good answer, uh, Jordan. Let me give you a big statistics on policy here. Since 1870. Legal immigration 
to America accounts for the fact that the legal Im immigrants are twice as likely to be self-employed than Native Americans. We have a lot of issues now relating to, to immigration and those immigrants over the years have enhanced American cities. They have provided, I'm sure when you went to, <clears throat> to buy everything there, that there were immigrants selling to you in small shops. How do you see the, uh, are you guys doing, I know you are doing some stuff on legal immigration, small business growth, policy. Where are the policies lining up given all of the uh, interesting kinds of uh, conversations about uh, illegal immigration uh, yeah. in America? No, that's and that's a good point. Uh, you know, we the U.S. Chamber is part of the Liberty Coalition, um, and that coalition really kind of believes two things: that you can walk and chew gum at the same time, you can secure your border, uh, but you can also have legal immigration uh, at the same time. Um, I, I would say this: one of the recommendations that came out of our AI Commission report uh, was uh, around the workforce area, and one of the pillars obviously was we need to. Um, uh, reform and also uh, put money into STEM education so that we're actually putting more out there uh, to prepare the workforce. Uh, but at the same time, another pillar of our AI policies uh, from that commission report was we need more high skill talent in the U.S. and we need it now if we're going to compete. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think we need to work to make sure that we can actually streamline immigration for high skill talent. Uh, that we can use that talent and come over here and, and actually help us compete. So um, legal immigration is incredibly important uh, for ensuring American success overall, but especially in the tech sector. Mm -hmm. And just keep in mind, as you, as you think about those things, being a college professor, that uh, family background and family mothers and fathers have a huge impact on on us being able to create the new tech people, you know, in terms of what happens at home. Math, for the most part, happens at home. Uh, and uh, learning for the most part happens at home and and parents getting on teachers about math and science happens at home. So in all of the policy, let's not forget that the uh, the great American family, if it deteriorates more, then we have less people. We definitely have to depend on our immigration then. Yeah, good point. Good point. So, so Jordan, I'm looking at the time here. We got four minutes. So what's in front of you the next six months? What's uh what's Jordan keeping busy about? I'm hoping that you're going to be able to join us at the Digital 360 Summit as a VIP guest. Uh, you're welcome to stop by in Austin anytime, of course. But what's in front of you the next six months? Feel free to share uh, your calendar or any events or anything that we should be aware of. Well, thanks for the invite. Um, you know, AI is going to be a significant issue area uh, going forward. Um you know, for the chamber. Uh, and so I mentioned we're having our forum uh, in Washington, D.C., but we actually are going to be going out throughout the country um, and talking in, in key states about this issue area and bringing together policymakers. So we'll, we'll be in Texas and we'll let you know uh, when that comes. Also, our small business uh, report uh, comes out uh, this month as well. Uh, it's going to highlight new numbers showing how small businesses are using tech to uh, uh, reduce costs uh, at a time of inflation and not pass those costs on to consumers. Um, and also um, that's going to get into some of the usage that of, of, of AI by small businesses as well. Uh, and so that's going to be a big um, uh, piece for us this year. Uh, and then also we're releasing a report uh, later this year talking about um, the, the benefits of government IT modernization uh, and uh, its cost savings effects. So that those are our three big issue areas we'll continue to push. Uh, but we'll once again track what Congress is doing in areas like data privacy and broadband and semiconductors. So uh, never, never a shortage of news uh, and work uh, coming out of the DC. Yeah, what, 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 one point that comes to mind real quick, Jordan, and I'm curious your thoughts or your perspective on it. There's the, there's a tug of war going on with uh, how technology, digitalization, automation, everything that we're trying to do sort of lends more to the city than to the rural living. Uh, yet people seem to be escaping the city and moving into the rural living by coast with solar panels and 5G. They can live anywhere and they want to live next to the beautiful flowers and the birds and all that. Uh, yet at the same time, within the city construct, 
Another thing is emerging that a lot of people don't talk about, which are the mega cities. So there's a big discussion going on on the obviously the, the population and the gravitation between this big mega city that is emerging between Austin, between San Antonio and Dallas in I-35, which would be really roughly a 30 million people city, a mega, mega, megapolis of sorts. Uh, there's also a big project going on on bullet trains in Texas, which is being tried forever, but it's finally going to happen, uh, connecting Dallas and Houston first and eventually Austin and San Antonio, bringing the four big cities together, which would, again, you know, we, the four of those cities are in the top 10, creating a new construct of, you know, sort of centralization. What are your thoughts on smart cities and what's happening? And how do you see the chamber dealing with that or being part of that dialogue? So it's actually funny. I'm actually at a smart cities uh, conference with C local CIOs just now. And mm -hmm. um, we're continuing to push for uh, policies that uh, enable things like broadband access uh, that enable smart cities, uh, as well as uh, bringing together the pr private and public sectors to really show off uh, the types of technology that can be used in smart cities, things like LIDAR. Um, but also, you know, I think you mentioned rural areas. Rural areas are, are actually benefiting from AI as well. And, you know, we're experiencing things like a nursing shortage right now. And even in Arkansas, I know of an example where hospital systems are using AI to help triage um, uh, uh, healthcare where there's a nursing shortage. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I think I think it's important to note that um, there's a tremendous benefit from from digitization uh, and for smart cities, but also that is also helping rural areas across America too. Yeah, gentlemen, any final thoughts for Jordan? Thank you very much, Jordan. You're in a very exciting area. I think I love the policy stuff, but there are states like Texas who would do do what they want to do. Just keep that in mind. Uh, Lou Ellen would never admit that uh, we, we're not pushed around. <laughs> I like the Northeast too much. We just kind of, we want cars. We want uh, we want our cars to be like horses, go wherever we want to go. And uh, live in small towns with no broadband. So uh... <laughs> I've told you before that there were cities on the Amazon once. They're not there anymore. <laughs> so we've seen these overnight miracles yeah. come and go. Yeah. Yeah. We're watching Austin with extreme curiosity. <laughs> no, John, we, we really enjoyed it. We, jo we joke a lot. You, you keep doing great things and making sure the policies happen. Well, yeah, Texas, right. Texas is doing a lot of great things in, uh, in the tech space. And uh, no, great to great to be part of this conversation and uh, look forward to seeing what comes in the future. It's, it's good to be with thank you, John. You no, betcha. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be well, Jordan. Say hello to everybody in L.A. Will do. Thanks again. Gentlemen, uh, any thoughts, uh, any feedback, any ideas? I, I think the chamber continues to play an interesting role. And I keep thinking about how they actually are a, a significant potential force for the, the notion of, you know, helping the Federation move forward with standards and, and uh, delivering sort of a harmony to how the experience of living and working and playing continues to um, evolve. Yeah, I have a thought, and I've worked with the Chamber over many years. I, they used to, we used to make television programs there. I was quite close with Donahoe when he was head of it. So I'm not entirely a stranger to the work and efforts of the Chamber, but by its very nature, it tends to be after the technological event, not leading the technological event. Um, it's just the nature of it. It's not an innovator itself. It mm -hmm. follows innovation and may spread innovation between entities, but itself, it is more a manager and disseminate, more of an educator in a sense, than it is a, an innovator. Uh, when I used to run uh, technology transfer conferences, um, it was interesting. We we talked to the chamber about participating, but really they didn't feel they had. And all those people have now retired, but uh, they didn't feel they had a role uh, to play because of the nature of the technology that it was ahead of their customers, of their members who are also de facto their customers. So it's interesting. I think chamber does a lot of good stuff. I'm not denigrating it, but I don't think you can look to it. 
for cutting edge because structurally it's not able to do that. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think it's a learning kind of uh, center. And I also think that um, for them to be cutting edge, they would have to be ahead of the technology curve. I think the emphasis on policy is good, but I also think that policy can become very, very, uh, well, you know, disruptive. People have to vote on it and et cetera. A lot of people don't like it. But what I like is I like the, the spirit of trying to protect the privacy of individuals. I like the spirit of trying to make sure that the small enterprises do well. I like that kind of spirit. So, it, so what he does is to educate small enterprises, if you will, that you can be more efficient if you if you just go digital. You can be more efficient if you use uh, this kind of technology, and you can mm -hmm. be more efficient, and you can indeed compete with larger enterprises by getting on certain kinds of platforms. But yeah, I think, I but I think a lot of people do that, not just chambers. I think that's what management is about. That's what what business education is about now, and so I think there's an overlap between uh, what I would call business education. And, and 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 all of the issues that he talked about, uh, data privacy, uh, um, you know, climate change, um, whatever. So therefore, they're now in a space that they've never been in before. I, I think that's right. And I think you're right, uh, John. Uh, the importance of, uh, if you can create the word, de-siloing uh, people mm -hmm. so that they know other ways of doing something. This mm -hmm. is very critical. Uh, that people who've done something one way and think that is the only way, when of course there are many ways to do most things. And an institution like the JMA is invaluable in bringing them together to hear from each other, to learn from each other, because uh, the, the, it doesn't happen otherwise. And one of the things that's happened in the last uh, few years since COVID has been fewer conferences, fewer conversations in the hall, uh, so that uh, if the chamber is holding conferences, that's very good and beneficial. And maybe we will see a return to conferences, but not in the scale we once had them. Part of it is a disinclination to fly when flying is so unpredictable and unpleasant. And part of it is we've just changed. The culture has changed. We've mm -hmm. become more of an internet culture and less of an in-person. But the exchange of information when you're doing it digitally is very limited. If you and I are talking, we may throw in something that wasn't critically important, but actually has huge significance. If we're simply sending emails to each other, it's unlikely to happen. So we need new ways of communicating among ourselves uh, in business. I can tell you this, Ann Richards became our chamber when she started saying, well, you know, you please move your business or y'all come to Texas, please. And then the chamber got behind and changed their entire, entire mode of operation. Become, and by Richards was a community. powerhouse. For enterprise, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking that, you know, in a, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, we're living in a, in a time where really all this, striking forces you know uh, we're kind of a global more global every day yet there's an anti-global movement china seems to be locking itself in as Llewellyn articulated um nationalism but then again at the same time you know the the corporate state johnny you know it, 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 i forget who drove that concept but at some point the geopolitical driver of the economy, the G20, is superseded by the World Economic Forum and the corporations are global. And now we have Vanguard, you know, Street, whatever, and BlackRock. They dominate the planet and control everything. And, and isn't the corporate state far more sophisticated in driving really what's changing versus the geopolitical or the rural versus the smart city or any of that? Well, I think that's very important. We always say when we do analysis, you have to look back, you know, to the curve years back and then move forward and then watch the curve. So mm -hmm. we know, for example, that that corporate has always been very, very important. And there's always been a conflict, if you will, between the geopolitical state and corporate. That is, if you look at the history of America, the question was, how do you, how do you, how do you stop the Rel Rockefellers from doing so well? The question is, how do you stop all the great, great corporations from from doing so well and keep them in line with our with our policies, right, of competition? 
and, and et cetera. The best kind of emphasis is that marrying between the corporate state and, and the political state. And I think that uh, if you go back, if, again, if you look back in history, Llewellyn, and, and if you look at what the Rockefellers went through before Congress, uh, you know, back in the 1930s and 40s, I guess, and then you come up to where we are now, and, and then you look at what Apple is, what is about to go through with Congress, then you find, um, Andreas, that, that that political corporate stuff has always been there. What has changed so great is the ability to move information around the globe. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's absolutely true. I'd like to throw out another thought. And it's that's what's changed. Yes. Uh, well, because you guys are good with numbers. Um, uh, as you know, I was on a <clears throat> big, long webinar with India this morning. And uh, it strikes me that the Indians are hugely gifted people. If you look across the mm -hmm. technology uh, uh, in the U.S., I think four of the big tech companies are headed by Indian. If you go to a utility meeting, you see Indian engineers in very critical places, etc. So you've got talented people, but there are 1.4 billion of them and uh, 300 and some million of us. Doesn't this eventually produce an imbalance in debt rate? because you're going to have more engineers inventing more in India than you are here as a mathematical no, inevitability. No, no, Ellen, you're talking about a drain, a drain uh, brain. Most of those Indians and in American companies are Americans now. And, and, well, that's and, true, but I, I'm yeah. talking about the identifiable talent. Right, the identifiable talent, it, and it's, again, they are where we once were. Everybody wants to do well. Everybody wants to, you know, get the country uh, going forward. Although we are less than, you know, 300 years old, so to speak, and maybe less than that if you say, just when we started automobiles and et cetera, uh, we're still a very young country, but we're still a very mature country. But I, I do think population plays a role. This yeah. did, wasn't always true. Because of technology, there was the British Empire. Uh, it was technologically based. It had the steam, well, from before the steam engine, it had a chronometer, so its ships were able to find out where they were in the world. They had the, uh, the development of weapons, etc., and systems. And then in the 18th and 19th centuries, the spread of British railroads, which very important, especially in the subcontinent, in Africa, etc. Uh, we don't have any of those advantages now. And advantages don't last very long now they last a few years if you're ahead technologically today inevitably almost like uh, like nokia you'll be behind tomorrow uh, well, yeah, I, 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 yeah Llewellyn, that's a good point but let's let's look at another study uh, israel which is a new country is very very small has no has no resources it's probably i would say the second most innovative country in in my data set Oh, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. So, so the numbers themselves, the numbers themselves, although they might be, I think they're really related to Austin, Silicon Valley, as sort of a, in a colony-like uh, point of view. But I think, I think it's an emphasis when China, you remember China just, I don't know, 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, they were riding bicycles and, 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 and not very, 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 you know, Connected. You know, I, I had a, an epiphany. I was in yeah, Vietnam. but now you know, I was a professor there at, at the University of Beijing. Yeah, and you can see the the two societies right by each other. You go on the expressway, you've got donkeys pulling horses, you've got Ferraris going two hundred miles an hour. So I think that when a country, uh, all I'm saying is, if you have ten gifted people on one yeah. side and you have a hundred gifted people on the other side, isn't there a high chance that the innovation will come from the hundred? Eventually, what, saying, if, what, if is, they... what has happened? What has happened is that Germany built our space program in the United States. We didn't do that. Germany built our airplane, our our jet program in the United States. Well, actually, it was a man called Whittle who was English, but that's all. Yeah, right. well, you know, you always go back to the British Empire. We need to talk about that. You know, the the, the sun... it was it was the most extraordinary piece of global <laughs> management ever seen. It I was. Told, it was. Andreas, I call. I told. I told Llewellyn, I'm celebrating the American Revolution. He said, "That's no revolution. That was a riot." <laughs> Uh, the, the trouble is, Johnny, you would so much like to be British. 
<laughs> and, and you're Louisiana. That's right, exactly. But what I'm saying is when you look at when you look at where we are now to, to answer your country, I mean, you know, I don't I think that uh that the that people come here because of the freedom to innovate. I think that our our MBA program I, I think all that's true. I, I think yeah. you do need a, a possibility. When I came to the US a long time ago, I read a book, it was called The Waste High Culture, and it said it was written by somebody who I think worked for Time Magazine, but I forget now. You can look it up. It's called The Waste High Culture. Yeah. Uh, and what he said was America was a yes country and Europe was no, were no yes. country. Exactly and right. that is absolutely, as a, I started a business in America and right. prospered. I could never have done it in look London. At, yeah, look uh, so we're not arguing this issue. We need yeah. to keep that going. All I'm talking about is a demographic issue. Yeah. When you've got a billion people in China and 1.4 billion people in India, isn't it reasonable to believe that they will become dominant in global technology and economics eventually? Yeah, wow. yes, it does. And, and, it, and it's already been proven. This is why the United States passed the British Empire, because we have more population. And we well, that's the pi- that's a fact, and, and raw materials. Yeah, we could produce we could produce fat more airplanes and more cars. Yeah, and more yeah, cars. yeah, yeah. And population played a big role. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, yeah, and you can't you can't. I'm very respectful of what Johnny says. Did you hear me say that? Very respectful of what Johnny says. <laughs> Repeat that. Get make sure uh, that's that you got to look back at history. You got to see where the curve is. But the determinants change. Uh, well, the, the, very, something... if you had an educated minority, you could control. And then, uh, the editor of the Times of India once said to me, uh, I knew him in Washington after he had retired, but I'd, actually I didn't know it worked for him when I was a teenager in Africa. Uh, he said, tell me this as friends, how is it? And I saw it, he said with my own eyes, that one young Englishman would happily control and three million Indians would be happily controlled. Well, that's a situation which did exist. It doesn't exist anymore uh, anywhere in the world, and it may never ever exist again. But that was uh, both a cultural, a selling of a cultural um, concept and uh, a certain acceptance, a fatalism that was very are common in the 19th, the 18th, and the 19th but, century in much but, of the but world. I, but I think, Whereas there's I think, less fatalism today. Most of the fatalism is concentrated um, probably in in the poor parts, which is uh, uh, in 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 Latin America and Africa. I you think know, the one point and you're making. I think the point that you're making is a great point, Llewellyn, because that is exactly why the third world countries are third world countries. Oh, India yes. still. India is still trying to figure it out how to govern itself beyond being dictated and managed at the imperial style style of the British. And, yeah, they and they made and a lot most, of mistakes. They, yeah, they, and most Latin countries are still trying to figure that out because the Spanish are no longer running the show, and and they're still dealing with your you know corruption and all this crazy stuff because. They have not realized, you know, the innate, innate values and the order and the discipline of the of the democracy and the discord and respect and you know all these things that we take for granted every day in the in the sort of the first world countries. But but here's the important thing about all this, really. Uh, in my opinion, it's always been the case since I went to work for Bill Gates early on in my career, uh, right out of school. That it, in the world that we're moving to, the world will be dominated and it will belong to the programmers. So India, being the single largest capital the, uh, player in information technologies in the planet, producing the most number of programmers in the planet, is destined is destined by fact to be the single largest 
force in the planet? When is the question? When is the question? I agree with that uh, in principle, except things can change. For example, that incredible start they got with programming in Bangalore primarily. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that may be overwhelmed by AI. AI is capable of doing a lot of programming. Could be. And Could be. All and those Indian engineers programming may not be needed. I've got to well, go. Guys. That, to and go. this is the case where technology wins out because then it is it is the expertise of business analysts in the United States knowing how to prompt chat GPT I would like to, to do all the work of the program. The conclusion should be that we don't bloody know. Uh, the conclusion is whoever owns the bomb. That's the conclusion. What's that? <laughs> whoever owns the bomb. That's the conclusion. Come on, you that's guys. Right. Where you been all your life? <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Johnny, guys. take yeah. us away. Yeah, play, the, play the music. Let's go. Bring the curtain down. No encore. Yeah, well, well, my friend. Yeah. They're appointed duty. They keep trying to tell me all you want to do is use me. Yeah, 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 but my name's Sergeant. All about a you. Yeah, well, well, and I want to spread the news that if it feels this good getting used, oh, you just keep on using me until you use me up. Yeah, until you use me up. That's a little electric guitar music for you. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay. Well, Thanks, I'm so buddy. glad, and the world is so grateful that the guitar must have been invented in Austin. Well, I think it was invented in in uh, Latin America. I think it comes from the loot. I can tell you no, this. When it doesn't. I was, it comes from I the, in Mexico City, and I had my... Middle country. East, the Middle I, East, the Arabs developed the guitar, and it moved to Spain, and, and from Spain, they got to Latin America. You mean the Africans invented the guitar. The Arabs didn't, didn't, didn't do that. Well, they have an instrument, which is... But they do. Just, yeah. Single string, so it's really not a good. That's a lute. They have a lute, but the lute came. Not a lute. The lute's like hey. a wind instrument. L Llewellyn, Llewellyn, give me We're your. Go. Give me, give me your top three artists that you love. John uh, Butler, one. What's the next one? Uh, Andres <laughs> Corvello. <laughs> Linda Gasparella. That's it. <laughs> I am going. Bye bye bye. Oh, uh, uh, all right, Andreas. I see you.